Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight um, on, a, on, a, on a rainy COVID evening, <laughs> Saturday evening. Um, I'm Dr. Alex Vernon. I teach English at Hendricks College in Conway, and it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm very thankful that all of y'all are here with us, too, and that Tim O'Brien is with us tonight as well. In addition to being part of the Six Bridges Book Festival, tonight's presentation is sponsored by the National Endowment for the Arts and Arts Midwest as a part of Big Read Cows and it is part of the CALS speaker series as the Fred K. Dara Jr. Lecture for events committed to civil liberties and education. But special thanks to Mark, Nate Coulter, Mark Christ, Brad Mui, and Nathan Smith for everything they have done to make tonight possible as well. So the plan for tonight, um, after I introduce Mr. O'Brien, he will talk and read for about 30 minutes, and then I will ask him some questions, and then I will ask him questions that you all provide. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen to do that. You're welcome to use chat. I'm not monitoring chat. I will only monitor the Q&A. So chat will go to somebody, somebody else is monitoring the chat, right? So if you really want to talk, pose a question to Tim, use the Q&A feature and I will curate those as they come in. And you don't have to wait until the actual question and answer period, right? You can start start doing that. As, as Tim is talking, you're welcome to start putting your questions into that. So tonight I'm thrilled to introduce Tim O'Brien. Um, I've been talking with a lot of people about Tim lately and, and his work, and time and time again, someone will refer to Tim as the writer of his generation. And notice, please, I did not say the war writer of their generation. They, they say he's the writer of their generation. Our Big Read programming focuses on Tim's fifth book, The Things They Carried, this one. Um, and tonight, we are actually celebrating the 30th anniversary of its publication. A finalist for both the Pulitzer Prize and National Book Critics Circle Award, the things they carried has since become the most widely read literary work from the war in Vietnam. It is, for example, the most requested title by local communities for big read programs like this one. Um, and according to one data set online, it is the most taught American novel in higher education English courses around the world. Whereas Ernest Hemingway was once the touchstone for veterans who swapped rifle for pen, I think it's safe to say that the new generation of veterans have flopped Hemingway for O'Brien. And we often think of Tim as a war writer, and indeed he won the 2013 Pritzker Military Library Award for Lifetime Achievement in Military Writing, that's a mouthful, um, and he's to date the only non-historian to do so. But I think the award he most prizes, and Tim can correct me if, he, if, if I'm wrong here, is the 2012 Dayton Literary Peace Prizes Richard C. Holbrook Distinguished Achievement Award. He's a peace writer, not a war writer. But even that label is too restrictive because it's a label. The syllabus for my war literature course at Hendricks has as its epigraph a quotation from Tim, quote, the environment of war is the environment of life magnified. In other words, war provides the novelist a nifty dramatic compression of human experience where issues of morality, mortality, human decency, and love can all be expressed and explored. Tim's most recent book came out a year ago. If the things they carried hovers between novel and story collection, the new one, Dad's Maybe book hovers between memoir and essay collection. It's a fantastic book, and if we had had the luxury of meeting in person tonight, it would be available out in the hallway for purchase. So I encourage you all to go check it out from Cal's library or call up Wordsworth book and, and get a copy. And I think actually um, part of Tim's talk tonight will, will work in the new book as well as the things they carried. One last commercial, and I will turn the microphone over to Tim. Um, if you enjoy this evening, or if you don't, please join Tim and me on November 9th, Monday, as the two of us have a conversation as two veterans who also write about war. So without further ado, Tim, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, hello to everyone out there. I can't see a single face, which is part of the awkwardness of doing these things virtually. I love making eye contact and listening to the audience. But here it's a blank screen. It's a little bit like talking to a head of cabbage, uh, if that. What I thought I'd do tonight, it's impossible, of course, to talk about an entire book. So what I, what I want to do is simply tell you two stories, which, for me at least, uh, get at, at least partially get at the heart of the things they carry. One is uh, set well after the war, and the other is set in the war. One comes from Dad's Maybe book, a recent publication, just a year ago. And the other comes directly from the things they carried. Uh, 
I want to begin with now or in the, in, of recent history and uh, tell you a little anecdote about an incident that occurred when my youngest son, who is now a uh, freshman in high school, was five years old. Uh, I walked into a bathroom off our living room uh, one afternoon and found five year old Tad peeing into a wastebasket. And not just a wastebasket, but a wire mesh wastebasket that was situated on a on a, a newly laid maroon carpet that stupidly I had purchased and put down myself. My wife thought I was nuts and it turned out I was. Uh, I spoke to Tad sharply. Um, too sharply, probably. And he froze. He started to move back toward the toilet away from the wastebasket, but stopped midway there and was peeing directly onto the carpet. I said to him, why are you doing this? And I said it several times, 10 times over and over. Why are you doing it? You know better. And he did, he'd been potty trained. But my tone of voice uh, scared the kid and paralyzed him. My wife heard this going on in the bathroom, came scampering into the, into the bathroom and uh, took over the discipline cleanup duties. She had Tad blotting the carpet with, with toilet paper, which made things worse little shreds of white paper, you know, a millimeter wide, just speckled the entire carpet. Uh, I pivoted, left the bathroom, went into my office, just muttering to myself about why, this, why would this kid do such a thing? Maybe an hour passed, maybe 45 minutes. Uh, not too long, but a little, a period of time for me to think about what had just happened. And, uh, after that 45 minutes or an hour, Tad came into my office. He, uh, he said, Daddy, Daddy. And I said, why? And he said, I've got two heads. And I said, what? And he said, I have two heads. And I said, what? He said, you asked why I did it. And it's because I have two heads. One head was telling me, daddy is not going to like this. And the other head said, this is going to be fun. Well, right away, my take on my own son did a 180 degree turn. I had come into my office thinking I was the father of a of a budding serial killer or, a, or something on that order. He'd end up, you know, stealing cars and doing drugs and uh, misbehaving in all kinds of grown up ways. I was scared for the kid. But when he uttered those words about having two heads, that's a pretty sophisticated thought for a five year old, at least I think so. It's pretty sophisticated for most politicians in this country. Uh, who have one head, and it's usually a pretty uh, bonehead at that. Uh, so I, I, I gained this respect for a five-year-old I simply hadn't had before. Well, that night, um, there's a ritual in our house where I had gone into the bedroom of our two, our two sons. The older kid's name is Timmy. He's uh, two years older than Tad. So Timmy was seven, Tad was five. I go into the bedroom with this ritual of every night telling them a made up, wholly invented story of my own. I'm a novelist, so why not tell my kids stories? And that night I began a story for these two little boys, seven and five years old, by saying, once upon a time, I actually knew somebody with two heads. Really, said Tad, in the dark as he lay beside me. What was his name? 
His name was Daddy, I said. Both Tad and uh, Timmy instantly jerked up in bed in the dark and kind of leaned toward me, looking at my neck as if seeking a, a head stump, you know, the leftovers of that former second head. You really had two heads, Timmy said. I did, I told him. Maybe more than two. And then, for the next 15 minutes, 20 minutes, I told my sons the story of what occurred to me in the summer of 1968, the summer I had become a soldier. In a way, I guess I was telling a somewhat cleaned up version of a chapter in the things they carried called On the Rainy River. One of my heads, I told the boys, was located over my right shoulder. And this head was fiercely patriotic, loved its country, respected authority, respected such values as duty and sacrifice and service to country. All the traditional uh, and valuable uh, and important uh, uh, values that most Americans carry with them. But over my left shoulder was another head, a head that found itself opposed to the war in Vietnam and wanted nothing to do with it, nothing. Certainly not the dying part and almost as certainly not the killing part. I was 21 years old. I was terrified. I was waiting for a draft notice. And so through the summer of 1968, those two heads I carried endlessly confronted each other, challenging each other, taunting each other, debating with each other, cussing at each other, invoking the names of LBJ and Abby Hoffman and Richard Nixon and Jane Fonda and Patrick Henry and Donald Duck. Now and then the two heads would talk to each other patiently and quietly and rationally. But most of the time, those two heads just screamed at each other as I lay in bed at night trying to find sleep. They screamed at each other black and white platitudes, much like those that were being screamed all across our republic back in that red hot summer of 1968. Well, by this point in my story to my kids, both of them were sound asleep. And yet I still lay there in the dark telling the story not allowed anymore, but telling it to myself, as I've been telling it now for almost 50 years, in fact, somewhat over 50 years. Now and then, the first head will score a sterile rhetorical victory. Other times, the second head wins the debate. Sometimes one head might say, what a coward you were for going to that war. And the other head will shake itself and say, you did what your country asked you to do. And the first head will chuckle and say, oh, right. And what if my country told me to blow up Toronto tomorrow? Would I just do it? And the other head will say, hey, your country is a great country that would never ask you to do such a thing. And the first head will say, what about me lying? What about the American Indian? What about slavery? What about weapons of mass destruction that did not exist? And the other head will say, everybody makes mistakes. And the other head will say, exactly my point. Everybody makes mistakes and on and on all night long. And this happens regularly, even now. 
51, 52 years later. Finally, one of the heads just says, come on, man, let's get some sleep. And we go to sleep. Well, it strikes me now on this uh, October evening in 2020 that maybe you, people who read books and tune into virtual podcasts like this one, maybe you too will find yourself engaging in these multiple head debates. Should I marry Bill or should I marry Phil? Or should I dump them both and marry Jill? Should I keep plugging away at this hateful job of mine? Or should I look for a better future in Tahiti? Should I go to graduate school? Or should I husk corn in Nebraska? Part of being an adult, part of being human, I think, as opposed to say being a chipmunk or a gopher, is that at certain points in our lives, often traumatic points, points of moral choice, we will all carry on our shoulders multiple heads, sometimes two, oftentimes many more. As a parenthesis, this is kind of for Alex, who's a friend of mine, uh, and who has come to understand through our time together uh, how mothy my memory is from 50 years ago and uh, how chronologies get scrambled in my head. It happened once again today uh, in an email exchange with Alex. And also because Alex himself is a veteran of another war, a West Point graduate and a veteran of a war. But I'd suggest that most soldiers carry more than one head. They may carry the head of pride for serving one's country, but they may also carry simultaneously another head disgusted by the things they saw and the things they did in a war, how ugly and nasty it is. Those are two heads, and I think there are multiple more than that for most uh, veterans of, of combat. Well. Two heads can be a curse. It can lead to late night second guessing, or wee hour remorse, or endless speculation about what could have been or what should have been. I submit that many of you may find yourselves one night lying in bed with your own children Revisiting a story from your own life, a story perhaps of a moral choice you made or failed to make or would make differently. I'm going to stop there, and uh, Alex, I'm sure, will have questions about what I just had to say, and no doubt he'll find glaring mistakes as well. <laughs> All right, the second little thing I want to do, this will be short. And then I'm, I'm mostly interested in a conversation. So this is a chapter from the things they carried, <coughs> excuse me, uh, called Ambush. And it's pretty much self-explanatory. I'm gonna read it to you. It'll take me four minutes or five minutes. And then I wanna talk very briefly about uh, the genesis of the story, what it came from, where, how it was born, why it was born. Ambush. When she was nine, my daughter, Kathleen, asked if I'd ever killed anyone. She knew about the war. She knew I'd been a soldier. You keep writing these war stories, she said, so I guess you must have killed somebody. It was a difficult moment, but I did what seemed right, which was to say, of course not. And then to take her on my lap and just hold her for a while. Someday, I hope, she'll ask again. But here, right now, I want to pretend she's a grown-up. I want to tell her exactly what happened or what I remember happening. And then I want to say to her that as a little girl, she was absolutely right. 
this is why I keep writing war stories. He was a short, slender young man of about 20. I was afraid of him, afraid of something. And as he passed me on the trail, I threw a grenade that land, exploded at his feet and killed him. I were to go back. Shortly after midnight, we moved into the ambush site outside a little village called Mikay. The whole platoon was there, maybe 30 of us, spread out in the dense brush along the trail. And for five hours, nothing at all happened. We were working in two-man teams, one man on guard while the others slept, switching off every two hours. And I remember it was still dark when my friend Kyle shook me awake for the final watch. The night was foggy and hot. For the first few moments, I felt lost, not sure about directions, groping for my helmet and my weapon. I reached out and found three grenades and lined them up in front of me. The pins had already been straightened for quick throwing. And then for maybe half an hour, I kneeled there in the dark and waited. Very gradually, in tiny slivers, dawn began to break through the morning fog. And from my position in the brush, I could see 10 or 15 meters up the trail. The mosquitoes were fierce. I remember slapping at them, wondering if I should wake up Kiowa and ask for some repellent, then thinking it was a bad idea, and then looking up and seeing the young man come out of the morning fog. He wore black clothing and rubber sandals and a gray ammunition belt. His shoulders were slightly stooped, his head cocked to the side as if listening for something. He seemed at ease. He carried his weapon in one hand, muzzle down, moving without, uh, I worry, up the center of the trail. There was no sound at all, none that I can remember. And in a way, he seemed part of the fog or part of my own imagination. But there was also the reality of what was happening in my stomach. I had already pulled the pin on a grenade. I had come up to a crouch. It was entirely automatic. I did not hate the young man. I did not see him as the enemy. I did not ponder issues of morality or politics or military duty. I crouched and kept my head down. I tried to swallow whatever was rising from my stomach, which tasted like lemonade, something fruity and sour. I was terrified. There were no thoughts about killing. The grenade was to make him go away, just evaporate. And I leaned back and felt my head go empty and then felt it fill up again. I had already thrown the grenade before telling myself to throw it. It was gone. The brush was thick and I had to lob it high, not aiming. And I remember that grenade seeming to freeze above me for just an instant, as if a camera had clicked. And I remember ducking down, holding my breath, and seeing little wisps of fog rise from the earth. The grenade bounced once and rolled across the trail. I did not hear it, but there must have been a sound because the young man dropped his weapon and began to run just two or three quick steps. Then he hesitated, swiveled to his right, and glanced down at the grenade, 
and tried to cover his head, but never did. It occurred to me then that he was about to die. I wanted to warn him. The grenade made a popping noise, not soft, but not loud either. Not what I'd expected. And there was a puff of dust and smoke, a small white puff. And the young man seemed to jerk upward as if pulled by invisible wires. He fell on his back. His rubber sandals had been blown off. He lay at the center of the trail, his right leg bent beneath him, his one eye shut, his other eye, a huge star-shaped hole. For me, it was not a matter of live or die. I was in no real peril. Almost certainly the young man would have passed me by. And it will always be that way. Later, I remember Kiowa tried to tell me that the man would have died anyway. He told me it was a good kill, that I was a soldier, this was a war, that I should shape up and stop staring and ask myself what the dead man would have done if things were reversed. But you see, none of that mattered. The words were far too complicated. All I could do was gape at the fact of the dead of the young man's body. Even now, 50 years later, I haven't finished sorting it out. Sometimes I forgive myself. Other times I don't. In the ordinary hours of life, I try not to dwell on it. But now and then, when I'm reading a newspaper or just sitting alone in a room, I'll look up and see the young man step out of the morning fog I'll watch him walk toward me, his shoulders slightly stooped, his head cocked to the side, and he'll pass within a few yards of me and suddenly smile at some secret thought and then continue up the trail to where it bends back into the fog. Why do I pick this chapter to uh, focus on? To give you just a really quick little uh, rationale using it. First, we're at war right now. Nobody really is thinking about it during our pandemic. Maybe that's a war as well. But we still have troops in danger. East. Uh, and this story, if nothing else, is a story about the final and ultimate reality of war, any war people killing other people. That's what war is. In fact, in my new book, I propose we call it that. Stop using the word war and just call it people killing, including children. Kind of long, but might work. It is a story about death. War is a kind of sanctioned homicide. It's also a story in which a single human death, just one, is lingered over and looked at in at least a little detail and not summarized by way of the kind of statistics you'll read in a newspaper or hear about on CNN. You know, 25 guys today died in Baghdad or whatever the number might be, where it's a statistic and just the fact died or were killed. Thirdly, I selected this chapter tonight because it's not true, at least not in the literal sense. For example, the character of Kathleen does not exist in the real world. I have no daughter. 
In fact, up until the birth of my uh, oldest son, I had no children at all as of 2003 when my son Timmy was born. This story was written much earlier than that. So I had no kids at all. On top of that, there was no hand grenade. There was no Kiowa. There was no trail junction. There was no morning fog. There was no star-shaped hole. All those details are the product of a novelist's imagination. And yet, in another much more profound sense, the story is true, completely true, utterly true. As a soldier, more than 50 years ago, I participated in dozens of such ambushes and similar operations during my time in Vietnam. I stared at dozens of corpses. And so this story is a way of collapsing all those ambushes, night after night, all those dead people, day after day, into a single pretty short story in which a reader might participate, one which might help the reader feel something of what I felt, which was carrying two heads. On the one hand, disgusted at the bestiality and brutality of war. And on the other hand, at least sort of proud of myself, not for the stuff I said, did, except that I kept humping. I endured in the midst of uh, all these second thoughts and doubts about the righteousness of my own war. I did keep humping. There was though, and I'm gonna conclude here, I have no idea how much time has gone by, but not a, not a lot. Uh, I wanna conclude by saying that there is, however, behind this story, a particular incident from which many details have been borrowed for this story. Um, not the ones I listed for you earlier, those are invented. Uh, it's the story of a, a night around two in the morning when we were awakened, a company of us by our, our platoon leaders and uh, told to saddle up, we we're gonna head out into the dark. And uh, we did, we marched for, I don't know, an hour, hour and a half, something like that through the midnight dark of Vietnam. Uh, pitch black, this is not Little Rock with street lights and you know, it's, it's, it's black. So black that my main terror that night as we marched through the night was simply getting lost. Uh, losing contact with the man in front of me or behind me, that black. Many guys would reach out and actually physically touch the rucksack of the guy in front of them. In any case, after an hour and a half or an hour or so, we ended up in a village whose name I don't know. I'll bet you Alex does know. Um, <laughs> that scares me when somebody else knows my own life better than I do. It's just terrifying. He's at work on a biography and he, he's reminded me of my own life so much that I feel like I'm not really Tim O'Brien anymore. I'm this imposter. In any case, we arrived at this small village. We encircled the place. Three platoons at dawn moved through the village. The fourth platoon, the platoon that I was with, I was a company commander's radio operator. And he and a couple of the other people in this headquarters unit were with another platoon outside the village. And the idea of the operation was kind of an ambush. The idea was for the three platoons to move through the village and press the enemy out into a rice paddy where the fourth platoon, the one I was with, was lined up along a paddy dike uh, looking out on the rice paddy. And the idea was just to gun down the VC coming out of the village. Well, for, I don't know, half an hour, nothing happened at all. It was black, couldn't see anything. And then very gradually in tiny slivers, dawn began to break. 
you heard that phrase from the story I just read you, it's taken from the real world. Just little slivers of light coming up on the horizon so that I could make out a few silhouettes of trees and off to my right where the village was and this flat rice paddy in front of me. Uh, as the platoons move through the village, this operation, unlike almost every other one we embarked on in Vietnam, this one worked. Much to everybody's shock, usually the enemy could hear us coming from, you know, miles away. We were young, dumb, uh, loud, noisy guys, even in the dark. When you're that young, you think you'll never die. Uh, the discipline was terrible. But this one worked. Three silhouettes emerged from that village and came across my field of vision, maybe 20 yards away, maybe 30, something like that. Not far and not super close, but close enough to make out their silhouettes and close enough to make out that they had weapons, which kind of glinted in that early dawn, purpley light. All of us opened up, the company commander, me, and that platoon of guys, about 30 of us, that number came from that night. Uh, we opened up with everything we had on these three human beings, M16s and M60 machine gun, hand grenades, we had claymores we'd set out, everything that the arsenals at Hartford delivered to us was delivered to these three silhouettes out in the dark. As full dawn came, uh, we saw there was one body left. How the other two escaped this barrage of gunfire and Claymore anti-personnel mines and hand grenades and machine gun, I don't know how they didn't die. But there was one dead soldier there that is kind of the basis for the man I wrote about in the story uh, that I read to you a few minutes ago. I did not look at that body um, like the character in my story who can't stop staring at the body. By that point, I'd seen one too many corpses. I didn't want to look at any more, partly out of superstition, partly because it was so physically disgusting to look at. What I felt, like the character in the story I read to you, was a crushing sense of guilt at the death of another human being, that person lying out in that rice paddy. I will never know if a bullet from my weapon killed that man lying in that rice paddy. War is chaotic. You can't see bullets hitting their top, their, their, their targets. There's all kinds of fear. There's a desire to duck and look away as much as you can. But this crushing sense of responsibility has stayed with me for 50 years, much like the conclusion to the story I just read to you, where the guy is sitting alone in a room or reading a newspaper, and he looks up, and there that guy is there once again, coming out of a rice paddy, out of a village into a rice paddy, or coming down a trail in the story. In a story, I can take responsibility. In a story, I can put a face on all that horror I witnessed all those faceless dead bodies. In this story, I can confront my own complicity in that horror. I was part of it. I was there. I was in an infantry unit. I pulled the trigger. I threw hand grenades. I was part of it. And I can't somehow find myself not guilty just because I don't know the bullet from my weapon killed that man, for I was part of it. Beyond that, in a story, I can make myself feel again feel things that are sometimes hard to grasp. You get pictures in your head, but the accompanying emotion isn't always there. And as I wrote this story, 
I felt I was back in the war, uh, feeling that crushing sense of guilt that the story was about. Okay, I'm going to stop now. And uh, Alex's turn. Forgive me if I light a cigarette. That's another Vietnam legacy. And the cold Coke as well. <laughs> and a Coke, yeah. Um, so it, you're turning it over to me only to, only to reflect questions right back to you. Um, I'm actually going to start, even though I had thought about starting with some of my own questions. We've, we've had several questions come in through the chat, and, and one of them um, really just is straight to what you were just talking about, Tim. Um, and, and Ellen asks, basically, why did you choose fiction as a way to explore your experiences? How did it help you shape and process your events? Especially given, I mean, you've, you've actually, in your war memoir, there's a chapter called Ambush, which tells the story you just told, but the real story. And of course, it's the same title chapter for the fictional version of it, right? Um, yeah. Why, what is, hmm, and, you, and it's, whether it's the fictional version or the real version, you, it, it's an incredibly compelling, powerful story. Right. Um, and so Ellen's question is, why, why choose fiction? Why go there? Um, how does it, how does it help you shape process? What, what advantages does fiction give you? Well, largely it's what I, the reason it has to do with what I just finished saying to, to make myself feel again. Mm -hmm. I felt when I was writing, if I die, but there was an intervening period of many, many, you know, a couple of decades, at least probably more than that. Uh, and also to retake responsibility. It becomes easy after a war is over to somehow forget, as I have many times, that I was, I pulled the trigger aiming at a human being. It's easy to forget it. And I think I had. Um, also in fiction, you can compress the anecdote, the real life anecdote, although I tried my best to condense it, contained extraneous detail. For example, saddle up, leaving the hill, marching through the dark. Ambush is much, much more condensed, uh, which is what fiction is good at. It's selectivity and choosing detail carefully. For example, there's a little detail in the piece of ambush that I read tonight. That every time I read it, I'm, I feel kind of a little glow of euphoria. And it's just a simple line about, I tried to swallow whatever was rising from my stomach, which tasted like lemonade, something fruity and sour. That, as best language can do it, captures what for me was terror. There's a, there's a taste in my mouth. Uh, yeah, my heart was going lickety split in times of terror. My blood pressure must have been off the charts. Uh, but that taste in my mouth that lingered after the event, that sour taste of participation in uh, death, no matter how righteous the cause, or no matter how unrighteous the cause, killing is killing. And when you participate in it, it, it leaves a the sour, fruity, lemonade taste in my mouth. Maybe others would articulate it differently. Well, that's an example of what you can do in fiction that I couldn't do in nonfiction because I didn't recall in a truthful way that taste. I don't. I didn't have that language for it, but in, in, in uh, the things they carried, I could. So compression is part of it as well. I guess a related question too. You know, a lot of people uh, when they read when they read the book um, overlook that title page work of fiction, and because the narrator persona in it shares your name, a lot of people presume it's it's, it's memoir, it's nonfiction, right? Um, yeah. And so I guess I'm, I guess the question then is, at some point you obviously decided not to name that character Herbie. <laughs> you decided to name that character Tim O'Brien. What, right. what was the what was the impetus? And, and, you know, the desired effect for that. Partly the challenge. Just a way a poet will say, I'm going to write a villanelle or a sonnet and obey the forms of it. My form was, I'm going to try to write a novel that readers may wonder, find themselves wondering, is this true? Is it, is it a novel? 
by using my own name, the names of uh, real places, uh, my own history. So it was a technical challenge, but the fruits of it became immediately important. It, sometimes it was just ling, ling, linguistic fruit. For example, there's a recurring phrase in what I just read. I remember, Fovener, I remember the smell. I remember this. It's used many times, but I don't. But by using the word remember, you, 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 it's, a, it's like a, a device by which you can make a thing feel immediate and real. Even in fiction, I announced at the beginning of the book, this is invented, this is made up, do not read it as nonfiction because it ain't. But you hope in a novel to seduce a reader into believing it. When you read Huckleberry Finn, you don't turn the pages and say, this never happened, that never happened, that never happened, that never happened, that never. Sooner or later, the book seduces you into believing in Huck and Jim and the journey down the river you're in almost as you would believe in a dream. Um, it, it, so the goal of all fiction is to make you feel and hear and see and believe it's real, even knowing it's not. That's what fiction is. You open any novel knowing it's a novel, but if that novel is any good, uh, you're going to believe it as you read it. Uh, you're going you're gonna to sort of slowly forget that it that it's invented. These are all these are all challenges that probably your audience aren't interested in, but, but totally dominated my life, as you know, for years and years. In in the story you read, of course, it starts off with the daughter Kathleen asking if you killed anyone, um, and you wrote that story as you said I mean, in the night in the late nineteen eighties, right? I mean, mm -hmm. well, well before right. you had children of your own. Um, and there's a reason you invented a character to, to ask the kinds of questions she did. And so I am mm -hmm. sort of curious about, about that, right? Why, why invent that particular character? Why, why a daughter? Um, and secondly, right. now you have had two children and now right. they, they have got, gotten to the age that Kathleen was imagined to have been. Um, right. And I, I don't want to drag Timmy and Ted too deeply in this <laughs> conversation, but I'm sort of curious about, about you know, how accurate was your prediction <laughs> about the pretty, curiosity of children toward their pretty damn? Life? It was so prophetic, it, it, beyond belief. It, I'm just shocked at how close. It, the, in many other ways, not just that way. Did you ever kill him? That question's been asked, and but not by my younger kid, but my older kid. Um, it grew this this device of using a child again grew out of me being pretty pissed off at adults who will dance around the obvious question that no adult has ever said to me, did you ever kill anyone in that war? I knew that in the infantry. And they, it's danced around as though uh, it's too sensitive a question to ask. And it occurred to me that probably a child of about that age would have the guts and, and the courage and the, and the forthrightness, the uh, emotional honesty to ask the obvious. And that so it grew out of what I was experiencing in, in my travels and to universities and events like this in person, uh, where adults avoid it at all costs. And I want, and it's a challenging kind of question because most for most soldiers in my unit, and certainly for me, uh, it's, you rarely know that you've killed anybody. It's really, it's such a chaotic, and in the infantry, foliage in the way, and rocks, and you know, jungle, and uh, plus you're not, half the time my eyes were closed, I didn't have to, you know, uh, out of fear. Um, and so you don't know if you killed anyone. What you do know is a trigger was pulled, and maybe you did, and maybe not. I'll, as I said in the story, I will never know whether a bullet from my weapon killed that man out in that rice paddy. He was actually a kid. He wasn't really a man. Mm -hmm. I'd say 16 years old, 17, something like that. Hard to tell. He'd been shot in the face, and his face was, was wreckage. Um, but that's where, that's where Kathleen came out, that kind of blunt kid's question mm -hmm. that challenged you. 
and uh, and uh, I in the story I evade the challenge. I say, of course not. That helped me not evade it with Timmy. I just said, I don't know, but I pulled the trigger. Mm -hmm. Another part of that story, of course, is that the narrator character who shares your name um, goes back to Vietnam and, and takes Kathleen to the spot where it happens. Um, and so one, one, of our, one of our audience members um, asks, if you ever went back afterwards, she apparently, her, her husband was an Air Force pilot and was exposed to Agent Orange and, and later died of, of cancer. And she and her daughter were planning to go to, to Vietnam um, before the pandemic hit. Um, and so she's curious. Oh, really? you, yeah, she's oh, wow. curious if you ever went back to Vietnam, and why, why, why not? What, what, how much did it accord with that predictive <laughs> short story? I did go back to Vietnam. I went back in 1994 for the New York Times Magazine. I went back reluctantly, not out of psychological, emotional fear of any sort. It wasn't that. I didn't. I didn't. I don't like airplanes. I'm a smoker. Twenty-four hours on an airplane was horrendous to me. Uh, I, I'm a partial to American food. I like McDonald's and barbecued ribs, and, and I don't like chicken heads floating in my soup and things like that. There are a whole bunch of cultural, not, not so good reasons for not wanting to go. But I was convinced to go by my girlfriend at the time who really wanted to know why I woke up. Not even woke up, why I would sometimes scream in my sleep and cuss in my sleep, my anger and also my long silences. And she was curious, she wanted to know me better. And so at her urging, we went back. Uh, she, she was older than uh, than Kathleen in the story, but at that point knew nothing much about the combat experience or about Vietnam itself, the war, a little, but not a lot. Uh, but I, I went back uh, for her, and uh, I'm so glad I did. Vietnam had been a war until I went back, and then it became a place, which was shocking to me. I didn't really, I mean, I saw the physical stuff when I was in the war, but it didn't seem a place. It felt just like mountains were a decoration for a war, and the jungle, decoration for a war in a jungle, patty were decorations. Um, but war, 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 and when I got back and found Vietnam is so much more full of decent, forgiving, gentle um, people. There's a, there's a hard side to, to it. Uh, the kind of uh, being led around by the nose that happened back in 1994, always escorted by people. But I did manage to go back to my old area of operations and managed to find places where things had occurred that had been uh, pretty memorable. And I'm, I'm glad I did. Uh, I remember we went to a, we found a, a place where I'd been wounded very lightly, I want to say. This was not a severe wound for your audience. This was just like, it if you get a shot with the, the COVID someday, it would finally invent it. It's going to feel like that. It was not that bad. But it hurt, and then it was over. But I found a place where, at the same place, a guy was killed, a guy named Roy Arnold, in the same firefight. And uh, that paddy had been full of such, like, full of ghost in my memory, and full of horror, and full of terror. I remember just muttering, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus over and over as the world exploded around me. And what I found in that patty was a place of incredible peace and beauty today. The physical, physical reality of Vietnam, the golden rice in that horrid rice patty, and the sunlight hitting the rice, and a little boy on a water buffalo it was kind of riding, waving at me. Um, so now there are two Vietnams. 
the war it will always be there in my head. Those, the badly, scram badly scrambled um, in terms of chronologies and lots of gaps too that you've helped make me aware of where I just forgot stuff. But it lingers. But there's also another Vietnam in my head now too, which is Vietnam of today. Mm -hmm. We, we have some teachers in the audience, um, and so a couple of questions from teachers. Um, one is uh, from an English teacher at Little Rock Central High School who teaches the things they carried um, and, and asks, is there anything you wish teachers did not do with that book? Any, in any ways of teaching, teaching that book that you, that you would rather they not do? <laughs> <laughs> well, do I mean, I, the only thing I'd suggest is just a quiet reminder that this is a work of fiction. Maybe every class session that you talk about it, just make a student read aloud. This is a, this is a work of fiction. Um, because as you said, Alex, um, I can't tell you how many times this book has been des described either as fiction or as semi autobiographic, which is, but it's not semi. Semi means half. And yeah, there are a few details drawn from my real life, my name. I think McAllister College might be in there, my hometown. But by and large, 99% of the events in the story are invented. And they're invented for the reasons we talked about earlier, uh, you know, five, 10 minutes ago. So that would be my, just a reminder that it's a work of fiction. And maybe the second thing is, is that I'm not a professional vet. Um, I was barely a soldier. I mean, I, I was a soldier under duress. I didn't pay attention to soldiering until I got to Vietnam. I thought they'd make me a typist. Uh, I'm a writer. And the things they carry is a written book. And I'm, what, what, what I'm, what I like talking about when I talk about the book, I like talking about detail, that lemonade taste, or the I remember, the repetition of it, what that can do, make the thing that's not real feel real, by the word remember. Um, it's the making of the sentences that is the hard work of a writer. It's not, maybe even, maybe especially for a war writer, because of all the cliches you've got to avoid and all the, the standard arc of most war stories, you know, moving from, as I did in my memoir, moving from hometown to basic training to the war and then home again. And kind of, all these cliches and conventions of telling war stories, uh, you want to avoid so that your book feels like something at least reasonably fresh to you and unlike uh, the, the, the so-called standard war story. So I guess the last question is also I'll ask from, from one of the teachers out there, and that, again, goes off of both your conversations about telling fiction versus nonfiction, and also this last um, comment about just the hard work and the pleasure of, of writing sentences, too, um, from another teacher who asks, and I'm sure you've gotten versions of this question a gazillion times, um, but what is your advice to the high school creative writing student about how to tell a story, how to, how, to, how to sort of engage stories, even the hard story, the stories that are hard to tell? Oh, there's so much to say. And uh, I, have, I have taught, and I still do a little bit, and I find it extremely difficult to teach writing because for everything that comes out of my mouth, every word I utter, immediately comes a qualifier or a modifier or exception to what I'm saying. And I, I am often just sort of dumbfounded at my own inability to uh, speak intelligently about it. Uh, it but it, it, I think that is intelligence, that you can't generalize. You have to look at a particular piece of writing and talk about Grammatical errors and uh, dangling modifiers, all of which get in the way of good writing. Uh, a reader may not know the name for the error, but hear, hear the error. Uh, uh, pace, uh, 
to trust it, your own story might be the best advice I can give. Trust it. Don't creep up on it. Don't foreshadow it. Tell it. The foreshadowing will find its way in. It will blend in with the story. Soul symbols. Don't plant symbols. They'll, they'll show up if they're any good. And they'll become symbols, but you don't manufacture one in like a dental implant and stick, stick it in the story uh, and then try to hang a tooth from it. They'll, they'll occur. To, to trust the, the, the power of, of your own imagination and of your own story. That advice is extremely hard to take when you sit down to write. Almost, you do almost everything but trust your own story. And uh, that, that's crucial, I think. I have to drive that trouble myself. Uh, trying to trust the, the story, I tend to overwrite and then radically revise. I mean, everything I do is, I'd say, 99% of my writing time is spent revising. And of that time, I'd say most of that is spent deleting. Is taking things out where I've been trying to enforce something on the story and not letting the story be the story. We are, we are about out of time. I'll, I'll ask you one more question in a second, but I do what I do want to share with you too is as I'm watching the chat that you're not seeing, um, how many people are just expressing their appreciation of of, of the book, of some of the comments you've made. Um, some we've got we've got one of your old students at University of Nebraska Lincoln who says that. What you taught him about line editing changed the way. <laughs> he <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Thank you for that. Um, the last question I'll go out with is a question I asked you before we got live. The very first question somebody asked is, what's the significance of the logo on your hat? <laughs> Callister? The Callister. Yeah. Is that what it says? Yeah. I went to college at McAllister. I spent the day today. day uh, My son is now taking uh, – I think in a week, taking the last of his SAT, ACT. McAllister is one of the colleges that he's uh, applying to. I hope he gets in. Uh, the college was important to me. For, and as much as Vietnam, I think it made me a writer because at McAllister, I took a single English course that was, I've talked to you about it, Alex, and I've yeah. talked by a guy named Roy Swanson, where over the course of uh, the course of the course, we read only five books, but there were, one was Ulysses, one was Sound and the Fury, uh, another was A Farewell to Arms, uh, another was The Great Gatsby, and the last, I believe, was Lucky Jim, that I know it was. I'm just wondering if there was one other, but I don't think so. And the way this teacher taught English was sentence by sentence, clause by clause, word by word, syllable by syllable making us listen to language. Um, why, was, why was that word used and not another? And, the, and, and awaken me to the, that books are made artifacts, the way a painting is made, with placing almost a physical sense, putting paint on a canvas or hitting physically two little keys on your typewriter, I-T, it. And then as soon as I type the word it, I'm thinking, big mistake. It's a pronoun. How will the audience, how will my readers know what it refers to? Well, sometimes they will, but you wouldn't believe how many times the pronoun is, is works in speech in a way it doesn't work on the page. Uh, so you get alert to, to language, and that, 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 McAllister is a, was, when I was there anyway, a fantastic place to, uh, to uh, learn about the world we live in, and especially the world of literature. And I wasn't an English major. Hmm. Well, I'll wrap up. Actually, this morning I received an email from, from a Hendricks student. It was not actually a student of mine, but was at Hendricks. And his, I think the, the girl he was dating was maybe was an English major and was reading the things they carried, and he just picked it up one day to start reading couldn't put it down. This email to me today uh -huh. said he's read it every year since, and it is it has changed. He says it's changed his life. Um, I, ho I hope he buys a new book every time he reads it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so just on behalf of him, 
And on behalf of everybody who has, who has loved your work over the years, I wanted to sort of thank you for that work and thank you for being with us and sharing of yourself. And I hope everybody joins us for our next conversation. It'll be a lot more fun. It'll be all just Alex and me talking. <laughs> thank you so much, Tim. Okay, thank you, Alex. See you soon. Yeah. Bye, Bye everybody. everybody.